Our next speaker is our own Matthew Rimmer from the Law School here at QUT. And Matthew is going to be talking about um, tobacco. Investing in smoking is investing in death. Smoking kills 15,000 Australians every year. It's predicted that a billion people will die early from tobacco this century. The business cannot pay for the harms that it does. It kills people when they use the products that they sell in the way that they are intended to be used. There is no safe cigarette. There's no responsible use. I would not normally be uh, a shareholder activist or be in favour of uh, divestment, but tobacco does require an exception. We wouldn't want to own one of these companies. We wouldn't want to start one of these companies. So why would we invest in one of these companies? Most of the community would be appalled if they thought that their investments were being used to shore up the tobacco industry. So how does it make you feel? Well, I feel really bad. Quite angry, actually. Taking advantage of? Well, dirty's probably not the right word. What? So my talk today is um, going to be about tobacco divestment um, and the various waves of action that have taken place um, in relation to tobacco control in Australia. So tobacco divestment for me uh, really kind of spun out of some of the work that I was uh, looking at in relation to the campaign for the introduction of plain packaging of tobacco products uh, in Australia. So it's been very interesting to me to see how the tactic of divestment has been taken up with some alacrity in the field of climate justice and climate activism. And there's lots of interesting kind of parallels and crossovers between the two. And really my work at QUT crosses over intellectual property and innovation law. Um, I also do a lot of work on public health and I also do a lot of work on climate change. Uh, so this work really kind of uh, is part of that larger body of work. To begin with, I think it's worthwhile talking a little bit about the World Health Organisation and uh, the role of Grow Harlem Brundtland, uh, both in terms of uh, transforming the World Health Organisation from a weak international organisation to a much more capable organisation. Uh, but also she kind of played a very kind of critical role in trying to set up a framework to deal with tobacco control uh, at a multilateral level and to, as part of that framework, think of a comprehensive set of measures to tackle the world's tobacco epidemic. And one of the really interesting things about the Framework Convention is that it specifically kind of talks about, in terms of its guidelines, divestment as one of these strategies to take, up on, take on the uh, tobacco industry. So Article 5.3 of the guidelines state that government institutions and their bodies should not have any financial interest in the tobacco industry unless they are responsible for managing a party's ownership interest in a state-owned tobacco uh, industry. As the former leader of Norway, Gro Harlem Brundtland has particularly had some influence uh, in Norway in terms of some of the debates over uh, tobacco control. As we just heard from the uh, brilliant speech from Bryn O'Brien, uh, Norway uh, has set in place certain exclusions in relation to the operation of its pension fund. And in 2009, really, there are proposals to exclude tobacco investments. And in 2010, um, the Ministry for Finance in Norway decided to exclude 17 companies that produce tobacco from the government pension fund global. Uh, so that was a really kind of important moment in terms of implementing that strategy in a very kind of effective way. In the Australian context, our debate has been very much kind of framed by some of the battles in relation to intellectual property and tobacco control. Uh, that have then kind of flowed on to larger debates about uh, pushing for the future fund uh, to the best from tobacco uh, and various state and territory governments. And then with Dr Bronwyn King, we've kind of had a further phase of 
activity in relation to pushing for tobacco divestment in relation to superannuation funds led by tobacco-free portfolios. Uh, now, a decade or so ago, I was rung up by a couple of public health experts from the University of Sydney who uh, asked me whether I'd be interested in contributing to a little paper that they are writing on the case for plain packaging of tobacco products. And in a kind of a bit of a pro bono effort, I thought, yes, I'll help out and collaborate. I'd done a lot of work on access to essential medicines and some of the battles on intellectual property and access to essential medicines and pharmaceutical drugs. And I thought the same principle should apply uh, in relation to tobacco control if you can introduce kind of special measures in relation to access to medicines to deal with public health. Surely you should be able to do the same in relation to tobacco control. And we also had the advantage of uh, the big tobacco litigation settlements in the United States, which were like a truth drug. They enabled us to have this incredible archive of all the uh, memos and submissions and documents of the tobacco industry's planning. And the tobacco industry back in the 1990s was planning for the introduction of graphic health warnings and plain packaging of tobacco products. They were setting in place arguments in relation to intellectual property and investment and in, and in respect of trade. Uh, so it was very kind of interesting to see um, from the germination of the idea that there should be the case made for plain packaging of tobacco products in Australia to having the health minister at the time, Nicola Roxon, uh, take up that idea and kind of run with it uh, for a variety of different reasons. At a kind of a personal level, her kind of dad died at quite a young age, probably from a tobacco-related uh, cause. Uh, at a more kind of professional level, she had kind of worked as an associate for Mary Gordon, um, so was very kind of well versed in some of the kind of the legal debates that were kind of happening in relation to the space. But as a health minister, she wanted to have a very strong impact in the short term that she was going to be there for. And she thought that tobacco control was a great opportunity to improve the public health of Australia um, in, in a very kind of systematic way. In response, the tobacco industry tried to stall the introduction of the plain packaging of tobacco products legislation in the federal parliament. And then in the end, the Liberal and National Party decided to support the legislation after some of the doctors on their side threatened to cross the floor if the uh, Liberal National Party kind of opposed plain packaging of tobacco products. Big Tobacco then launched uh, a constitutional challenge against plain packaging of tobacco products in the High Court of Australia. Um, they kind of argued that plain packaging of tobacco products constituted an acquisition of property. Um, the High Court of Australia ruled 6-1 in favour of the Commonwealth and held that there was no such acquisition of property. They emphasised that there was a long history of using packaging and labelling in a wide range of different contexts in Australian history and overseas. Intellectual property was designed to promote the public interest. It didn't give uh, private intellectual property holders the right to ignore regulation. Uh, and there was also a discussion that acquisition had not taken place. The intellectual property had been preserved uh, of the uh, tobacco companies. And there was also quite a bit of discussion about the implications of the decision um, for um, other subject matter like food labelling, for instance, and junk food labelling. Since that time, plain packaging of tobacco products um, has spread throughout the world and we've had something of an olive revolution in relation to plain packaging of tobacco products. Ireland and the UK and France have pushed ahead with plain packaging of tobacco products. Uh, the UK High Court smacked down a challenge by the tobacco industry to its introduction of standardised packaging. The judge in that case um, said that uh, you know, tobacco companies didn't have any right to compensation given the nature of their products. Um, furthermore, with the, kind of the evidence of the efficacy of plain packaging of tobacco products, other countries like New Zealand have pushed ahead with the plan. Uh, the tobacco industry has fought back in a number of different ways. They've tried to use their investments uh, to claim in foreign investment tribunals that their investments have been adversely affected. So Australia just recently won a case uh, in an arbitration dispute with Philip Morris under an investment agreement between Hong Kong and Australia. Uh, the tobacco company had argued that it amounted to 
an adverse impact upon their investments. Australia successfully argued that there had been an abusive process. Philip Morris knew that Australia was introducing plain packaging for tobacco products, and then they shifted their assets off to Hong Kong so they could um, take advantage of this particular clause. Likewise, Uruguay has successfully defended its graphic health warnings from a challenge from Philip Morris uh, with the help of Bill Gates and Mike Bloomberg. We're currently awaiting the World Trade Organization decision on the legitimacy of plain packaging of tobacco products um, after a challenge by five other nations. So plain packaging um, has proven to be a very kind of effective measure in terms of tobacco control, often aligned with tobacco taxes. As a kind of a secondary strategy, tobacco control advocates also pushed for divestment um, in relation to tobacco investments, particularly by government. Um, so there was a very kind of peculiar situation at the time in which the Labor government um, had agreed to put in place pioneering plain packaging of tobacco products. But nonetheless, Australia's future fund uh, was very reluctant to divest itself of tobacco. And there seemed to be kind of cabinet battles at the time over this particular issue. So uh, Nicola Roxon seemed quite keen on pushing ahead with tobacco divestment. Penny Wong, who was finance minister at the time, was very concerned about interfering with the autonomy of the future fund. But at repeated kind of hearings before Parliament, um, Richard Di Natale from the Greens and others put a great deal of pressure upon um, the Future Fund until such time as they agreed to um, divest, uh, and particularly kind of highlighting um, how they've been investing in some companies who are based in Indonesia and some of the ramifications, particularly in relation to children's rights for that. Since then, there's also been a number of territory governments and state governments um, who have taken action. So the ACT, where I'm from, has always been a pioneer in relation to public health. Uh, Caddy Gallagher, um, who was leader at that particular time, um, helped support the federal government in the plain packaging of tobacco products case. Um, but she's al always been very kind of keen on taking tobacco control action. So that was a very kind of important exclusion. Um, Mike Baird, um, as Treasurer in the New South Wales Government, also agreed to ban tobacco investments. Um, and somewhat more slowly, Victoria has kind of followed suit. Uh, but there's been a, a great deal of attention and pressure on focusing upon government investment in relation to um, tobacco. And just to sum up, um, there's also been a kind of a new ways of tobacco divestment focused upon superannuation funds. Initially, ASH, um, the tobacco control advocacy organisation, ASH um, was prominent in the debate over um, tobacco divestment in Australia um, with Ann Jones. But really, the gauntlet has been taken up by um, tobacco-free portfolios. Um, as a kind of a key agent of change in relation to um, tobacco divestment. And particularly Dr Bronwyn King, an oncologist based in Melbourne, um, has proven to be a very effective advocate for tobacco divestment by superannuation funds. Uh, she said, in my early time as a doctor, I did a placement on the lung cancer ward of the Peter McCallum Cancer Centre in Melbourne. Despite being able to offer the very best medicine available, the majority of my patients died, many of them in their 50s and 60s, some as young as 40. It was shocking to bear witness to the true impact of tobacco. Whilst the treatment and care of patients is paramount, we must deal with the source of the problem, tobacco and the companies that manufacture it. Once I discovered that through my compulsory pension fund I was invested in and actually owned a part of several tobacco companies, I couldn't just do nothing, I had to take action. Um, so she's been very kind of keen on leading uh, this effort to encourage superannuation funds um, with her colleagues to divest. Um, she notes that tobacco stocks are generally picked up in standard products. Um, she said that uh, she founded tobacco-free portfolios to collaboratively engage with leaders of the finance sector to encourage tobacco-free investment. 
There are now uh, 35 tobacco free pension funds in Australia, just over 40 per cent of all funds. Each tobacco free announcement is met with resounding public support. Her strategy is a much more of an insider strategy. Um, so, as opposed to publicly naming and shaming companies, she's much more keen on privately lobbying uh, entities. Her big success has been AXA, um, who announced a tobacco free decision in May. 2016, divesting 1.8 billion euro of tobacco assets, and she's kind of hopeful um, that more um, entities like AXA will follow its lead. So just to wrap up, I'd just kind of like to kind of make the crossover point for our next session and say that the tobacco divestment movement has been a great inspiration for climate activists and climate action and climate justice leaders. Obviously, there's been a crossover in terms of the way in which the tobacco industry and the fossil fuel industry have often deployed very similar tactics. Uh, but likewise, it's been very interesting that agents of social change have tried to deploy some similar sorts of tactics against those entities. And the work of Naomi Oreskes is really kind of interesting in that respect. Uh, but you can kind of see some certain kind of commonalities of problems across the two sectors. And it's been interesting how activists in relation to climate change have learnt a lot from some of the battles that have taken place in the public health sphere in respect of tobacco divestment. Thanks very much, Matthew Rimmer from the QUT Law School.